Welcome to this Jungian life. Three good friends and Jungian analysts, Lisa Marciano, Deborah Stewart, and Joseph Lee, invite you to join them for an intimate and honest conversation that brings a psychological perspective to important issues of the day. I'm Lisa Marciano, and I'm a Jungian analyst in Philadelphia. I'm Joseph Lee, and I'm a Jungian analyst in Virginia Beach, Virginia. I'm Deborah Stewart, a Jungian analyst on Cape Cod. Halloween is a fun time for kids to wear costumes, attend parties, gather up candy and store it for weeks. But it's also an ancient, or not, (laughs) (laughs) or eat it all in 24 hours. But it's also an ancient Celtic holiday called Samhain, which is a time when the veil between the living and the dead thinned. This is when the uncanny side of psyche or the irrational manifestations of the unconscious were highlighted. And with the suppression of pagan rituals and ideas by the ever powerful Roman Catholic Church, non Christian images were seen as evil, instinctive impulses that challenged the asceticism of the new faith were banished. And these were called Satan, which in Hebrew, means adversary or accuser, or devil, which in Latin, diablos, means the slanderer. And very interestingly, the Greek word diablos is composed of the prefix dia, which means a cross, and balin, which means to throw. So diablos means one who throws accusations across, or one who divides. In the Latin, Lucifer was actually the name of the planet Venus, the morning star, and Venus, the goddess of love and sensuous beauty and sexuality, became an enormous problem for the powerful ascetic church. These ancient images and archetypes don't go anywhere, they just go underground. And as Jung said, the ancient gods and goddesses become symptoms because they are no longer understood consciously. They were reactivated in the United States in the 1980s and 90s in an event called the Satanic Panic. There was a widespread moral hysteria centered on unsubstantiated claims of Satanic ritual abuse involving child sacrifice and abuse and strange occult practices, which actually were modeled off of movies that people had seen and simply believed were somehow newsreel correct. And psychologically, it was fueled by mass anxiety, false memory syndrome, and societal fears of moral decay as the culture was changing post-1960s. So rooted in the ancient collective projections of archetypal evil, panic exploited the unconscious archetypal fears of the other, blending scapegoating dynamics with modern conspiracy theories. And so today we're going to talk about the satanic panic because it's still alive and well. Well, and it's it's an iteration of something that is always with us. And, you know, disturbingly, even though uh, it eventually sort of ended um, and many of the ac- false accusations were overturned, even somewhat recently, um, you know, there's, there's, there are others afoot, there will be more. And it's something about needing to understand how these archetypal forces, which you expressed so well, Joseph, get constellated for us and can, can um, lead us astray. And this is a theme, a particular kind of panic that is basically, I think, probably as old as man, Uh, that in the early uh, Christian eras and not so early, you know, anyone non-Christian was attacked and accused of, you know, all sorts of horrific things involving babies and children called the blood libel. 
um, we had all over Europe and in this country, we had the Salem witch trials uh, where people were accused, found guilty, and, and executed. And then we moved on, so to speak, with the McCarthy trials in the 1950s. And there were a whole series of, of films in um, the late 60s and se early 70s, Rosemary's Baby, which uh, I remember watching with, with total horror, uh, which was then further exacerbated by the film The Exorcist, which scared the living daylights out of me. That was so scary. <laughs> and then I never did see The Omen because I had learned my lesson, just don't go there. <laughs> um, but there, then there was there was the Charles Manson group that was tainted with uh, echoes of Satanism because it was so grisly and and appalling and and horrific. And then we had all the stuff around daycare centers, the McMartin preschool, and others, uh, where everybody was up in arms about it. There was an NBC special. 2020 did stuff on on all of this, and almost 200 people were charged with crimes, and dozens of them were convicted. So this is something that, as you were saying, Joseph, it goes underground, sort of, but uh, like flowers in the spring, they easily pop to the surface when the conditions are right. And there are we surmise certain things that happen in the cultural psyche, that there are cultural complexes, and when large groups of people are put under certain stressors, they're more vulnerable to the activation of certain things. So right around the 1980s, which is the Reagan era, there was an enormous political change that the evangelical right decided that they had a mission to move into American politics. Prior to that, the fundamentalist Christian church functioned quietly within their own communities. In fact, they, their message was to withdraw from the world because it was wicked and to create enclaves of goodness and fidelity and, and virtue. But something changed in the 80s with just a handful of evangelical leaders who decided that they we're going to lead an evangelical war by taking over the Republican Party, was what they had decided, and successfully did that. And so with a kind of national campaign that began to move religious ideas like the great fight between good and evil and the presence of demonic influences in, in all quarters of the government which needed to be routed out and changed, which, by the way, is exactly what the Spanish Inquisition talked about and did for about 350 years, came this enormous fear that evil and terrible destructive intent was housed everywhere. And this coincides also with an enormous cultural shift of women going into the workforce and the rise of putting children into daycare, which was a very kind of reasonable solution to this um, phenomenon. And so there's also what I would imagine a tremendous amount of unconscious guilt, both in fathers and mothers, putting their children into this institutional care. The guilt that, oh my goodness, I'm doing something bad to my child. Freud was the first one to say, that goes underground because we don't want to, we can't tolerate thinking that. And then it gets projected. And so my fear that I might be doing something bad to my kid becomes you must be doing something bad to my kid, even though I don't know you. I have no evidence for that. You know, I want to, and Joseph, you, you sort of referenced this, but I want to bring it in really explicitly um, it, to, to sort of set this, this discussion up with a quote of Jung. So I just want to share this quote. Uh, shared it many times on the podcast before. It is certainly one of my favorite Jung quotes. Um, but let's, let's have it here in the background in our discussion. 
We think we can congratulate ourselves on having already reached such a pinnacle of clarity, imagining that we have left all these phantasmal guides far behind. But what we have left behind are only the verbal specters, not the psychic facts that were responsible for the birth of the gods. We are still as much possessed today by autonomous psychic contents as if they were Olympians. Today, they are called phobias, depressions, and so forth. In a word, neurotic symptoms. The gods have become diseases. Zeus no longer rules Olympus, but rather the solar plexus, and produces curious specimens for the doctor's consulting room, or disorders the brains of politicians and journalists who unwittingly let loose psychic epidemics on the world. So as you both were saying in 1980, you know, there were these cultural forces going on. There were many kind of contributors that sort of seeded the imagination. And then there was this book published, Michelle Remembers. And it was written by a Canadian psychiatrist by the name of Lawrence Pazder and his patient who became his wife, Michelle Smith. And uh, I think, did I say they were Canadian? They were. Um, And they, you know, had he had used this discredited recovered memory therapy to make claims that she had been um, ritually satanically abused. And there were there were reports of sexual abuse and physical abuse and and all kinds of occult satanic rituals. It was really out there. And it was completely unsubstantiated. In fact, it wasn't corroborated by members of her family or other kind of facts that you could determine. But the book became a huge success. And then people started using it as reference material for training therapists and training law enforcement people. So it sort of got instantiated into institutions that this was something real. And it was really that book in a way that kind of um, unloosed everything. But it was taken up by the government. It was taken up by law enforcement. It was taken up by therapists. So uh, we, we somehow, you know, this got seeded into our imagination at this particular moment. And, and it did let loose a psychic epidemic on the world. That was very costly. I mean, there were the people who were accused and lost decades of their lives in jail, some of them. But also, you know, there there were there were children who were taken away from parents. And these children were told that their parents were, you know, ritually abusing them. So these children experienced these, um, you know, kind of life-changing disruptions in their attachment relationships, you know, that could never be reclaimed. So there, there was a tremendous cost to this. There was, um, just to hear you uh, talk about that, it's just heartbreaking. Uh, and I want to go back to what makes our collective ground fertile for this kind of seeding. Uh, we hear all kinds of things at, in various uh, times, histories, cultures, and we brush it off and we say, oh, no, I, uh, well, maybe, but I don't think so. Whereas this took hold in a particularly pernicious way. And I want to go back to um, what we just touched on. Of uh, This was a time when women were going back to work and and not being uh, so much stay-at-home moms. And there's also the revolution that, uh, quote, the pill um, made possible. So there was a huge revolution in um, women's ability for self-determination. I remember way back when going back to work and reading The Managerial Woman and Dress for Success. (laughs) Uh, I remember that. Yeah, of how 
how to do this thing. And I wonder if that in some way of a monumental change in the role uh, that women could have and could choose for themselves uh, really also gave rise to this kind of shadow about what happens if women aren't home caring for their children. Yeah. So one of the things that is also at the the base of this um, terrible phenomena, which is still an enormous problem in our culture, is the impulse to literalize things that are fantasies and symbolic. Right. Jung has said, and I wish I could find this quote because I know I'm paraphrasing it, but um, he was talking about containment and uh, or writing about it, and he said that it's the devil that makes you want to think it's literal. Oh, that's Maria Louise von Franz. Oh, it's von Franz. Thank you I, so I much. Can, oh, I can get that. Yes. I'd love to have that yeah, quote I can get correctly. That. And there is something to that, that um, there is there's a way in which our senses can just be trapped into a materialistic perspective. So whatever my eyes see, well, that must be the fact. So, I mean, that's what fuels this thing about the flat earth theory, that my eyes tell me that the horizon is flat, and so therefore the earth must be flat. So when we begin to extend that into mystical texts like the Bible or, or other mystical texts, and we take everything as literal in a materialistic way, it alienates us from reality, it alienates us from consequences as well, terrible consequences that are done in the name of literalized fantasy material. And so as psychoanalysts, we're very interested in people's fantasies, but we call them fantasies. These are products of the unconscious, and they are full of meaning. And they are more meaningful when they are looked at symbolically. That's beautifully said, Joseph. And I and I think it's like you're saying, like this this fantasy material is important. We should we should treat it as if it's important, but not treat it as if it's literal and concrete. And this this is the great like literalism is the great sin of modernity, really. And it, you know, it's like Debbie said, what seeds us. And I want to say, well, I think it's normal. I think we're always doing this. And, and, and the problem is, I think we've diagnosed it, Joseph, with what you said, that it's, it's a, it's a problem of, of being, of being too concrete. And, and that quote, or at least one of them is Marie Louise von Braun says, the devil is the one who wants the concrete thing. Great. Thank you so much. (laughs) Yeah. He says something which has no existence in concrete reality is not real. So, um, but, it, but I want to say, you know, it goes back to that quote from Jung, where, where he says, you know, we think we've gotten rid of our prejudices and our, and our uh, you, you know, being superstitious by, by not believing in, in the gods anymore. But instead, in fact, they've just, they've actually gotten more concrete. And that creates a problem. So if we could relate to any of this stuff as, as fantasy material, as you're saying, Joseph, then we wouldn't, we wouldn't be caught in this. So I, I think that is a big part of it, is a, the, a lack of ability to think symbolically or psychologically and to, to, to take these things as literal. And to also take our feelings as a, a given. If I feel something, this strongly, then it must be real. Yes. And I think that gives rise to all kinds of things about, you know, at that point during the, what was then termed the satanic panic, you know, people were saying, you have to believe the children. Yes. Who are, of course, highly suggestible. The interview techniques were nowhere near as well developed as they have been since. Uh, so, uh, you know, children were, in a sense, kind of coerced uh, to let loose their imaginations and strong feelings. And that was, quote, evidence, unquote, of then it must be real. And we have a number of societal issues going on now uh, around abuse, 
uh, and women? And do we simply believe? How do we take it seriously? How do we take these things into consideration? Um, and how do we do uh, our our own conscientious sort of investigation, not to mention fact checking? Mm -hmm. You know, um, there's this idea that I think is kind of relevant here. It's this idea called fairy tale science. No, I'm sorry, tooth fairy science. And it's an idea that was posited by the doctor Harriet Hall. I love this. <laughs> mm -hmm. Yeah, it's very cool. And it's where you, st it's, it's studies that investigate something that is unfalsifiable. So you, you can gather up a lot of, let, let me, um, let me just read you some quotes from Hall because I, I think it'll, I think it's kind of relevant to what you're saying. So she says, tooth fairy scientists mistakenly think that if they have collected data that is consistent with their hypothesis, then they have collected data that confirms their hypothesis. So you could measure how much money the tooth fairy leaves under the pillow, whether she leaves more cash for the first or last tooth, whether the payoff is greater if you leave the tooth in a plastic baggie versus wrapped in Kleenex. You can get all kinds of good data that is reproducible and statistically significant. Yes, you have learned something, but you haven't learned what you think you've learned because you haven't bothered to establish whether the tooth fairy really exists. And it seems to me that something like that was at play in this, where you're, you're, you've got this book, Michelle Remembers. You take it as fact, and then you start designing public programs to train people how to ferret out this abuse or how to respond to it. You, you sort of, it begs the question, you just made an assumption and this happened at the very highest levels. I mean, Janet Reno was involved in prosecuting one of these cases. So, you know, the, 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 the penetration of this belief was extraordinary, and it never passed the common sense test. But what um, you're also talking about here is how powerful confirmation bias is. Yes. You know that if, if I see that leaving a tooth under the pillow uh, results in payment, and payment is higher for molars than it is. <laughs> uh, the natural conclusion is definitely uh, the tooth fairy must exist. And, and I check with my friends, and the tooth fairy comes for them too. Um, therefore, it's real. And, and Janet Reno was a member of the Supreme Court, by the way. That's how how high up the judiciary ladder, so to speak, this went. But that we cherry pick things that fit our internal theory, our bias, our wish to believe something. And then the facts fit in and support uh, something that really is not objectively real. She was the attorney general. She wasn't ah, part of the thank Supreme you. Court. Yeah. Okay. I had to look that up to be sure. But yes. Yes. Um, absolutely. We we're, we're, we we start with the assumption and then we proceed from there rather than than really kind of doing doing our due diligence. But we're all susceptible to this. But that in itself is so fascinating that we start with assumptions. We start with an assumption that there are these uh, satanic, uh, predatory cults, little groups that do these things. We start with that. And that's really a hell of an assumption. <laughs> it is. Isn't it? That the people that are running your child's daycare center are uh, practicing satanic rituals on preschool children. That is an amazing assumption to even consider, much less expand on and, and believe. And it's frightening. I think, I think that's also what, what we need to really hold. I mean... In, in a smaller way, we're seeing that again with cancel culture. 
is it um, false aspersions, the devil who throws accusations, constellates in the collective, and then strange things are done, and your, your wife posts something on Facebook, and then you lose your job as a corporate CEO, which, by the way, happened. I mean, it's, it's bizarre to see this the incredible, dangerous horror that happens around the constellation of the, of the devil as the accuser. And it destroyed people's lives. I found out only recently that in the small town of Edenton, where I have my weekend place, that, that there was a major satanic panic trial. Um, I, I have not had it in me to ask anyone local about this because it must have been horrific. But uh, it was called the Little Rascals Daycare Center, which apparently was really infamous. So in 1989, a bunch of these kind of religious leaders became obsessed with the daycare center, and they uh, charged um, Bob and Betsy Kelly and a bunch of other minimum wage workers with in, that's incredible um, things of, of killing babies, um, which of course they never, never, they never found, found a them. dead like baby. None of the parents never lost a baby. It. Right. They all picked them up at day school, right. but somewhere there are the bodies of babies that aren't being revealed and children being taken out onto the, onto the ocean in boats and subjected to things, you know, while you're at work um, and coming back. And then all kinds of strange, grotesque ceremonies, and then of course um, horrific sexual fantasies are projected onto this. And so the accusations start; it catches on fire. The investigations come in, and particularly the children, who are coached and coaxed by asking very specific, fantastical questions. I mean, have you ever seen this holding up a pentagram? And did anybody ever do this to you? I mean, kids are very impressionable. Mm -hmm. And also they can feel the incredible fear. Well, and they want to, and they want to please, right? So of course they it's do. like, oh, you know, the, the investigator gets excited when the kid says, oh, yes. And so the kid keeps going, you know? Yeah. And one of the adult, uh, adults who was a child uh, and was interrogated said he lied because it was the only way he could get away from the questioning, that he, he, he wasn't going to be allowed to leave unless he said what his interrogators wanted him to say. So uh, over a hundred counts were leveled against um, this fellow Bob Kelly, and he wound up being um, sent to jail for 10, 12 consecutive life sentences in 1992. And many, again, of these of local, you know, retired moms who were working for a minimum wage to take care of kids and change diapers, you know, were now being accused of being, you know, the brides of Satan. Many of whom, by the way, were not offered adequate defense attorneys. So, so many of them just um, took whatever plea bargains they could to try to keep themselves alive. Finally, years later, by the way, that they were exonerated, um, and and it was seen as an absolute travesty, and all of these alleged convictions were overturned. Everyone's record who was burdened with this horrific nonsense was exonerated and cleansed, and yet no one gets their life back no. from this. And the incredible post-traumatic trauma of being put through that as an adult is, un is and the, unimaginable. And the years lost in prison. And, and you cannot prove. How do you prove it? Prove what? Uh, that you're innocent. Right. Because it's, un it's unfalsifiable. It is unfalsifiable. But Joseph, I want to go back to something you said of Satan as the accuser. I think that's really um, important. Can you um, expand on that? Well, it comes from um, the etymology of the word. Uh huh. That um, in Greek, 
uh, the word devil means to the one who throws accusations. And, and so it, it, it had a very specific meaning of, of a slanderer. And that in, first of all, in ancient communities, people who lied in an ancient tribe were often even put to death or they were, they were abandoned to, to be exposed to the elements because the, the, the tribal leaders understood how unbelievably poisonous it is for somebody to seek to, to lie and to destroy a culture through lies. So it, it was taken very seriously as something that was horribly dangerous. The idea of um, the adversary, which is more of the, the word Satan, which some people say is linguistically connected to Saturn. And in astrology, Saturn is the great malefic. And the idea is that when Saturn comes across your astrologic chart, it, it causes things to gum up. It makes things hard for you. and Life becomes adversarial to the desires of the ego. So in the book of Job, you know, Satan is where that word shows up in the Hebrew Bible most frequently. And Satan is the one who creates the problems, the adversarial things. But as, as um, theologians look at that, in that way, Satan is explicitly the servant of God. God tells Satan to have his obstructive way with Job. And Jung, in his analysis of the book of Job, talks about the transformation of Job through being relativized to the divine, that there is something inside of the self that at some point will make sure we know that we are very small compared to massively powerful dangers. And that famous quote where Jung says, and I'm going to paraphrase, I see everything that crosses my path and thwarts me as God which is a total transformation. For him, he means that the self is anything that the ego wasn't prepared for. Because if the ego was prepared for it, it's about the ego. So all of the uncanny interventions, good, bad, or indifferent, that move our path in a direction, he does see from that transpersonal standpoint, and that we are required to respond with a kind of adaptive, creative intelligence. And so in that regard, Satan, in the Hebrew Bible, is the one who forces human beings to learn and grow because of the suffering and obstacles that are put in front of them by Hashem, by, <laughs> under the direction of a god. Lots of theological ideas I've just thrown out there. But again, it goes to this idea that this is archetypal and that human beings create these symbolic mythologies as a way of trying to understand their own unconscious forces, that our own unconscious mind is the one that puts obstacles before us. One, to help us learn and also make us conscious of, of the incredible internal forces that we think are not there until our marriage blows up, our business closes down, we get sick because we were smoking for 40 years, etc., etc. Our Patreon has had a makeover. There's lots of new content and ways to engage with us. Patrons who support us at the $5 level and up will now access Young Love, weekly bonus episodes where the three of us discuss dreams and questions sent in by supporters. At the $10 level, you can vote on topics for podcast episodes and vote on which guests we invite. And at the $25 level, you'll also be able to watch behind-the-scenes content and even join us for occasional live events. If you'd like to be a part of all this, the link to our Patreon is in the show notes. Thank you so much for your support. We couldn't do it without you. And the archetypal polarity of good and evil is probably you know, one of the very most basic ones. And that, as you said, uh, you know, we are small and we are at the mercy of many forces. 
And I think there is some way that some of this is apotropaic, a way of warding off evil by being especially good, playing by the rules, um, references to moral standards, et cetera, as a way of making sure that that some of those other horrific uh, feelings uh, do not take us over. I will be safe. You, you know, the thing about these moral panics or psychic epidemics, whatever you want to call them, one, one of the key features of at least many of them is this sense of uh, a kind of battle between good and evil. And we're good and evil is out there, whether it's, you know, the Red Scare and McCarthyism or, uh, you know, or the Satanic Panic or any of these. Um, we know what evil is and it's not us and we need to get rid of it. So there's, I mean, there's that thing that you referenced earlier, Joseph, about the scapegoat, about the sense of uh, trying to protect ourselves. You know, it's, it's a very, in some sense, a sophisticated defensive process that we identify evil, we see it as being out there, and then we can make ourselves safe, we think, by excising it. But, but really, they're just phantasms. I mean, the other thing that comes up for me, Joseph, is you sometimes talk about the mixing of the levels, which goes to the danger of concretizing something that should be symbolic. You know, so there, there's, you know, the level of uh, this horrible fear or guilt I might have, for example, about leaving my children in daycare. If I can deal with it psychologically, uh, you know, maybe looking at my fantasies, my dreams, my feelings, then I can be in relationship with it. But once it becomes part of the U.S. justice system, that is the wrong place for it. And that's where I know we're right now in a big political yeah. turbulence in the United States. But yes, there's an enormous amount of projecting and fantastical beliefs that are being projected onto one leader or another leader. And the way for people to get out of that is to actually look at policies, because that's the way the government is going to reach into your personal life. Look at the policies that the various parties are, have put in place and are promising to put in place, not, not the mythic theater that's going on in social media. And that's a way to evaluate whether or not one person or another is actually going to help or hurt your interest, that the stories that we make about the leaders in the collective is so um, shockingly mythic that it would be funny if it wasn't so frightening because people lose contact with just reality. I did want to go back to um, the idea of uh, the birth of good and evil. And uh, I was thinking, uh, Lisa, you had been reading. Um, Jung's writings on Zoroastrianism, thus spoke Zarathustra, as well as Nietzsche's commentary on it. And, and as far as we know, this um, very clear polarization of good and evil seems to have come forward around 600 BCE. And this particular uh, conflict between Ahura Mazda who is the supreme god of all good things and wisdom and truth and order, and Araman, or Angra, mind you, the destructive spirit representing chaos and evil and lies. And this profoundly influenced all of the religions in the Middle East, uh, and Christianity is an Abrahamic Middle Eastern religion. So the battle between light and darkness, good and evil, which again culminates in the triumph of Ahura Mazda and the perfect world, is, is something that is woven into our bones. But there were faiths before that, that I think were, might very well have been more embracing of a world where suffering and triumph both exist on a spectrum that is not so split. That's a good point. That's a good point. That that it's somehow this is in our cultural DNA or something because of these religious uh, 
the religious bedrock that our society is based on. And I think when tensions get high, uh, the tendency to polarize increases so that we have uh, good and evil, right and wrong. It's a way of managing our anxiety, right? It's a way of managing that. Uh, and the other thing that happens is we are uh, story writing creatures. We are meaning making creatures. So I see this on TV. I hear it from someone. I read something. I have certain uh, inputs or information. And then I write a story about it. That, um, you know, when this happened and then that happened, and then it means this. And that's my story. And it relates to, I liked your phrase, Joseph, the mythic theater that is playing out in our collective now around uh, the election. It's unbelievable. And if we could say, wow, this is mythic theater, um, let's investigate this. It'd be great. And I want to say that one of the candidates for president has actually verbalized the same blood libel and said that there are clinics that are killing live babies. Which is, a, which is the exact same thing that came out during the satanic panic. It's the exact same horrific nonsense that medieval Christians who were jealous of prosperous Jewish families would say that they had um, stolen uh, a new infant and used their blood for the Passover chalice. So that is, that is, go that is a unique test of the reality principle of Americans, and people are repeating it, and they're believing it again. It's being echoed back and forth and back and forth, just like it was in ancient times, as it was in the 80s, and people are not thinking, thinking. So there's a writer named Megan Phelps Roper, and she wrote, I believe it was a memoir. She was raised in the Westboro Baptist Church, and then she sort of deprogrammed herself. And she has this great list of questions, six questions to ask yourself if uh, whether or not you're um, whether or not you're um, let me think how to say it. You're, you're being you're, you're caught by something. Okay, I think it's a really interesting list. I'm going to read them. Are you capable of entertaining real doubt about your beliefs or are you operating from a place of certainty? So if we think about the satanic panic, you know, there, there were people who said, maybe this isn't really happening. And you know what people said? They said, believe the children, Deb, like you said before. So if you questioned it, you were considered to be, you know, a terrible person because you didn't believe the children. But but that that um, that that phrase, believe the children, is kind of a thought stopping technique to get you to not think, to, to, to get you to not entertain doubts. So can you really entertain doubt or are you operating from a place of certainty? Number two, can you articulate the evidence that you would need to see in order to change your position or is your perspective unfalsifiable? So. If you believe that there are satanic ritual there's satanic ritual abuse happening at your daycare, can you can you come up what, what evidence would you need to see to have that disproved? Mm -hmm. uh, you know, the, the, for example, the the lack of any um, you know the lack of any physical evidence that this happened, and in fact, one one of the things that happened during the satanic panic is um, they actually said. Um, Missing, I'm actually quoting here from Wikipedia, missing memories among the victims and absence of evidence was cited as evidence of the power and effectiveness of this cult in furthering its agenda. Like, look how, look how effective they are at burying the evidence. Isn't that amazing? So if you're using negative evidence as evidence, you're dealing with something that's unfalsifiable. So what evidence would you need? Three, can you articulate your opponent's position in a way that they'd recognize or are you straw manning? 
you know, could for those who were saying, you know, I don't know that this uh, satanic panic is really a thing, you know, were, would you have been able to say, to say, well, here's what they believe and do it in a way that's fair. Are you attacking ideas or attacking the people who hold them? So there, there were people who were, who were denounced and, and sort of had their, uh, you know, their livelihoods threatened because uh, they, they dared to question that this was going on. Are you willing to cut off close relationships with people who disagree with you, particularly over relatively small points of contention? Are you willing to just cut someone out of your life because they hold a different view? That might be something to think about because it says that you can't tolerate uh, being in contact with someone who doesn't support your beliefs, which may mean that your beliefs are actually uh, resting on a, a weak foundation. And six, are you willing to use extraordinary means against people who disagree with you? For example, forcing people out of their jobs or homes, violence or threats of violence, celebrating misfortune and tragedy. So um, I, I love that list of questions. I think, you know, and it's something, you know, Megan Phelps Roper talks about, well, I grew up believing this and then it was all wrong. How can I trust my own mind again? And I think the thing that I want to say, I know I say it all the time, I want to say it again. We are all susceptible to this. In fact, the more intelligent you are, the more susceptible you are to all this because we're, we could all be uh, misleading ourselves. I think that in terms of other research around this phenomenon, people who have had any kind of a early trauma history have a tendency to want to project those nefarious um, agendas onto other people. One of the things I also want to just put out briefly is, is the reality that memory is plastic. And by plastic, I mean plasticity. Memory can be poured into many different molds and, and mixed with mythologic material, mixed with events from other experiences, which is exactly what Jung was talking about when he was describing and discovering the complex, which was his first great discovery using the word association test, that you can read somebody a single word, pond, tree, cat, and the incredible number of associations that are grouped around that. And those associations, in a sense, talk to each other and create an overall feeling and attitude about the thing. So an initial experience gets added to and added to and added to and added to, in this case, by the parents and the investigators who are leading the children into these terrible, false situations. But as Lisa was saying, for all of us, as the decades go on, that our memories are being reformed over and over again. And as Deb, you were saying, because we are self-narrating beings, who we think we are also changes because the narrative changes. And then we mistake the narrative for reality. So, so Joseph, I just want to kind of build on what you just said um, and, and to lift up that really the bedrock of what you're saying is we're un there's a part of us that's unconscious and the unconscious is powerful and it influences us. So if we take a particular view of our past life or our identity or who we are or, or what happened to us or what we think happened to someone else, we have to take into account that we're being influenced all the time by unconscious forces. I'm going back uh, to what you said, Joseph, about the plasticity of memory. Um, I once a long time ago took a class on memoir writing, and it was called Memory and Imagination. Mm. And uh, how we shape our memories, what even sticks in our mind to remember in the first place. Uh, I think we all have had experiences, those of us with siblings, of don't you remember the time that mom did this or dad did that? And the other sibling goes, 
I don't remember that. Oh, no, it was so important. Remember, it was a, like, nope. Um, it didn't, it didn't lodge that the power of the unconscious is that real. And to take memoir as a function of weaving a story, as a function of imagination. Um, and uh, there was a woman uh, who wrote the Satan Seller. Um, and it was a memoir that was a bestseller. And then it was completely debunked. Um, we, we have the child trafficking Pizzagate more recent quote scandal that was entirely fabricated with no reality whatsoever. But these things lodge in our imagination. They take hold and they feel real because they are real symbolically, metaphorically, and psychically, but they are not real as external, uh, facts in the world. And that is a tough thing to separate those two things. You know, I want to I want to bring this home because the truth is that the satanic panic among the various groups that were implicated in it, there is one very big group and it's therapists. Oh, and and therapists, you know, it was it was the guy Pazder who wrote the Michelle remembers with his work with his patient who later became his wife that kind of started there. There were therapists who got very interested in hypnosis. Um, one of the important guys, I think, was also as yeah, he was a psychologist, um, Cord and Hammond, who did a lot of damage. He was a psychologist. Lots of therapists out there thinking that they might have a patient with, uh, you know, repressed memories of satanic ritual abuse. And uh, we, why, why did we participate the way that we did? Because we did. And by the way, one of the things that brought it to a halt was therapists being successfully sued. Um, and I, I think we have to take uh, responsibility for this. And, I, and I've thought a lot about this because I think we're all always a danger at this. So first of all, I think that as therapists, we want to help people. And that means that sometimes we can have a savior complex. We come swinging in and we think that we're making all the difference in saving the person from this terrible fate. We are susceptible to that. But also mental health is, it's very different than, than being a medical doctor because the things that a medical doctor deals with can often show up on objective tests you know, you can go to the doctor and say you have a sore throat and he can do a test and find out whether or not you have strep throat. But if you go to a therapist, everything that we deal with is, uh, well, maybe not everything, but most of what we deal with is subjective in nature. We're dealing with what patients report to us. We're dealing with impressions. These are either behaviors that, that you know, frankly, could be um, encouraged through suggestion or subjective feelings, which, of course, matter. I'm not saying they don't matter, but we have to be aware that they can be interpreted in different ways. And we have to be responsible about how we interpret them. So our field in particular carries a lot of blame for what happened. And I think we need to be very aware of the potential for future such kind of psychic epidemics stemming from psychotherapy. And I think that um, savior complex, not just in therapists, but in the culture, yeah. is hugely activated because the victims were children. Mm -hmm. You know, the innocent and the young uh, is a particularly horrific uh, image that calls up our righteous fury, and uh, there must be something going on, and we're going to find the supposed bad guys and and root them out. Um, that we do root for uh, innocence, and we 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 root for anyone who's an underdog. Uh, and, and some of it is compensatory. I mean, all of the kinds of accusations, uh, much more recently where women have spoken out against abusers, compensatory to abuse in some number of cases mm -hmm. that did transpire that was culturally sort of swept under the rug. 
it gets very sticky and very thorny. And I like the um, steps you articulated, Lisa, about are we coming from a place of certainty versus being able to entertain doubt? Uh, can we look to the evidence? You know, and Joseph, you were talking about facts and policies. So it calls what it should call up, one would hope, would be, wow, I really need to engage in a thorough investigative process around this rather than reacting. I think relative to this word responsibility that's floating around, Modern therapists are responsible for staying informed, integrating new information, questioning whether or not what they're doing is sound and based at least on the most recent discoveries around what is efficacious. I don't know that any practicing therapist now is responsible for something that happened in 1970. I graduated from high school in 1980. Oh, no, I, I wasn't trying to apply that at all. I just think... But I do think that there is... That when any of us are in fields where um, we hold a lot of trust, continuing to be educated and informed is really on the onus of the therapist, the physician... Well, I'm, but I'm going to push back on what you're both saying, though, that we can just look at the facts, because the truth is that the nature of what we're talking about alters our perception of what we think can, is trustworthy and, 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 and that we, we, can, we can try to stay ahead of the current evidence, but we all have confirmation bias about which evidence we're going to listen to. So we're talking about therapists. So what is the conclusion you want people to come to with your advocacy right now, Lisa? Um, that, that we just need to be thoughtful and maybe apply those six questions to any strongly held beliefs that we have. And you're talking to everyone? You're talking saying to therapists? Oh, I think to everyone, but I, but I, but I, do, I do just, I do think that our profession uh, has a particular tendency to get swept up just because of the nature of what we deal with, because we deal with the psyche, which, which you know, doesn't, doesn't lend itself to kind of objective tests. Everything that we deal with in some sense in psychotherapy, uh, well, I, I don't say it's all unfalsifiable, but there's a, there's a strong subjective element to everything we deal with, and we just need to be aware of that. There, there is, and I think one of the key things that we also do is to help our clients differentiate between sort of what's inside and what's outside. You know, is um, my, my boss really, does he really have it out for me? Um, you know, we, what am I, we go around and around of what did he say? What was your annual review like? Um, how many other people got a salary raise versus you didn't, um, if that's even ascertainable. But we're always helping p uh, people and ourselves um, go back and forth about what's going on, what else can I bring to the table here in the way of consideration, evidence, external world reality versus my internal world reality. They're both real. But they're in different categories. That's your idea, Joseph, I think, about the levels. Mm -hmm. Yep. Yeah. And I, and I think that most therapists are really working hard to do something good in the world. Oh, of course. And I think most therapists are reliable. I know that there are certain trends that therapists can get caught in, whether it's 1980s and everybody's learning hypnosis and guiding people down strange um, mystical paths to discover hidden memories in a pool underneath a rock, and then taking that as factual, and then getting that confirmed. There are agendas, even right now, that are moving through certain psychotherapeutic traditions with certain values that might skew objectivity. But I do think that it is reasonable for most people with a well-vetted therapist to have some sense of trust in the therapist's intent. And in terms of the therapeutic efficacy, 
What's more important than whether or not every word the therapist says is exactly precise or objectively researched is that the other person feels on a deep and profound level that their therapist intends to help them and wants the best for them. And then whether or not we are perfect or imperfect in an intervention can be forgiven, can be moved aside. Because the talking cure is, in essence, has something to do with love, as Freud said. To be cured through a kind of depth of attention, of desire to help. What I do think is that when any professional is possessed by the accuser, what happens is they've abandoned being therapists and they have taken on the role of forensic investigators who are excited by the opportunity to participate in the great world of accusations. And they are no longer therapists in those moments. Yeah. You know, of course, what we want to do is to help. And um, I go back to uh, James Hollis, who's a Jungian analyst with a, a wide body of, of books that are available to the general public. And one of his mantras that he passed on to us is, what it's about is not what it's about. And what you see is compensation for what you don't see. And that's the part I was uh, speaking to about inside, outside. What's the meaning I make of it? I'm sure that, uh, I'm just making this up, but I'm sure that my boss just hates me and has it in for me. Well, what it's about is probably not what it's about. Let's walk around it, walk around it, do some discerning, and start to differentiate uh, what is my internal world story from what are the actual events in the external world. And that's what we do that isn't directly related always, as you were saying, Lisa, to facts, but it's a process of circumambulating, walking around and around something, and starting to differentiate uh, different aspects and different elements of it, rather than taking something and just running with it. Yeah. And, and you know, Joseph, I really like what you said about when the therapist becomes the accuser, because uh, that, I think, is exactly you really put your finger on a kind of dynamic where, where maybe it's a therapist. I'm thinking also of the, the sense of kind of inflation that I mean, that anyone could get in any career. I mean, I think I'm I'm looking at our part simply because, you know, this is our backyard. But but this would be true in in law enforcement or, you know, in education or in any of these fields. Um, but, you know, are you getting inflated? Are you getting um, hopped up on the idea that you're the, the 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 righteous accuser, you know, and, and if so, that might give you pause. You know, what's going on? You know? And we, and we leave the realm of healing psyche and we're in the realm of something else. Mm -hmm. I do want to also circle back, because we have just a minute or two more, around the idea of the plasticity of memory, because this is a well-researched yes. topic. Yes, Elizabeth Loftus has done Elizabeth the research Loftus. on it. Yes. Everywhere from the 1970s through the 1990s, she was a pioneering cognitive psychologist, and she revolutionized the understanding of human memory. And this was very important in understanding false memory syndrome. And she did these um, almost humorous experiments where she would take groups of people and use different techniques to slightly suggest that they had had an experience like getting lost in a department store or trying to convince them when they looked at a car crash suggesting to them how fast the cars were going and then finding out in the survey that all of them would report exactly what the interviewer told them the speed of the cars were, but they were absolutely convinced that they had seen the cars going at that uh, speed. So it lets us know that, well, she says that about 25% of the participants added enormous amounts of content to the memories that were totally fabricated, and most of them 
could not remember things accurately. And if any of you remember that children's game, Telephone, so somebody would whisper something, you know, like the rhinoceros um, answered the telephone and picked a flower. And then it goes around a circle. And then the final person says what was spoken into their ear. And it's like shockingly unrelated in any way to the first statement, which speaks again to even short-term memory. Being able to repeat just a sentence is so influenced and changed by our neurology. Yes. Mm -hmm. That our bodies do these really interesting things that short-term memory is in a certain part of the brain. And then as images, ideas, memories get distributed, they move broadly into other parts of the brain and are linked with other things. And um, part of this is, you know, the archetypal and mythological nature of our psyches. So if uh, people are told about, you know, the time when they got lost in a shopping mall, it never actually uh, probably occurred. The archetypal root of that is being lost and getting and getting lost. And that there are gazillions of stories about exile and abandonment and being lost. And we and all we've all either places. been lost or felt lost. Like you're right, Deb. That's great that it has an archetypal basis. Yeah, yeah. I remember being lost, and yeah. um, a shopping mall is evocative and it's big and it's impersonal and so on and so forth. And that sounds right. Yeah. That's and great, Deb. The kind of mythopoetic nature of the way we process experience. I think it goes back to what you were saying about like we're storytellers, you know? Yes, so we, we're storytellers. Yeah. And, and um, for a lot of things, there is an archetypal taproot. Um, you know, having a machine, um, this is something you've talked about, Lisa, of having a bread making machine on your counter. Yeah, yeah. Couldn't be more modern, mechanical, um, et cetera. But it has an archetypal root of bread as the staff of life. So being abused, being lost, uh, being afraid, being at the mercy of these are all, gigantic. You've, you know, everybody has those experiences. Yeah, it's because it's, it's archetypal. Yeah, that's really that's really great. Um, and, and so, you know, you know, we're, 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 we have all these threads here and, and I just, I can't help but bring up just one more instance of when there was another kind of, um, psychic epidemic that happened at the hands of, well, he didn't think he was a mental health practitioner, but Charcot at the Salpetriere at the end of the, uh, at the end of the 19th century you know, he diagnosed all these women as hysterics, and he could kind of induce in them these really remarkable symptoms. And then hysteria was everywhere in Europe for a few decades, and then it just went away. So this is, you know, this is a, this is a modern thing that happens. It's happened many, many times. It, as like we said at the beginning, it happened with McCarthyism. And where might it be happening right now? Oh, golly. Um. <laughs> yeah. Well, I have to say that um, because of social media and the incredible connectivity, unprecedented connectivity that these kinds of misinformations and accusations can surge through a million people in five minutes. It's ten turbocharged minutes a day. now, isn't it? Yeah. So. There is something about the, the credibility that we give to printed material. Like that book that came out with that goofy hypnosis experiments this guy did on his soon-to-be wife. Because it was in print, we lend it a kind of credibility because we trust publishers won't, couldn't possibly put out something that was so fallacious. Same thing with newspapers. I remember this was probably in the late 70s, early 80s. I was visiting my grandfather, who I loved, my mother's father. And uh, my grandmother and grandfather were very, very gentle, very, really kind. And I sat down next to him. And then he very suspiciously folds a newspaper and kind of tucks it down under the side of the couch. And, uh, and I was old enough to ask. I was like, 
what's that? And he goes, oh, no, 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 no. It's not something you should be reading. Oh, gosh. It's, no, it's, it's, um, it's really. So, of course, you really, read it. <laughs> well, so I, I tell him, I say, you know, I think I've been maybe 17. I was like, it's okay, Grandpa. I mean, I think you can do it. So he opens it up, and he's really stricken. And it says that uh, aliens have invaded the White House, and here's a picture of an alien that someone in the White House has given birth to. And um, and because it was in newspaper, I think it was in the Post or something, um, he was frightened. And he wanted to protect me from this kind of H.G. Wells situation where but, aliens but that did have really invaded. happen, Joseph. You know, it did, but we're trying to cover it over in the in the podcast. So be careful because they're listening. Um, but but in a not funny way, um, it was I was just kind of shocked. Sadly, I didn't know what to say, and so I didn't say anything. But I I felt so concerned. But it was my Prejudice. first initiation yeah. into. I mean, this it's like the National Enquirer. I mean, these are. This is a fiction thing, and it might even be fun if you know it is. You know, it's satirizing everything. But for my grandfather, for whom something is in print, means it's the truth. That was really alarming. And we're still in that place in some ways. And it might help us to think about all the stuff, whatever that is that you're reading, seeing, listening to, as mythopoeic tales. Of wow, what is that about? What is being spoken about? And what are the feelings underlying it? Is it righteousness? Is it fear? Anxiety? Uh, what is this? But to appreciate um, how easily experience, content, etc., gets shaped by the psyche into a story that then purports to be quote, real, uh, unquote, factual, objectively uh, existing in the world. And this is an age where all kinds of storytelling is fulminating everywhere. So there are a couple of refuges people can go to. One is the False Memory Syndrome Foundation. One of many, many organizations, this is out of one of the universities, fmsfonline.org. And this is an organization that's trying to both study and confront individuals who later in life, through the manipulation of therapists, come to believe that they were horribly abused by parents when there's absolutely no evidence of it. And then parents get these terrifying phone calls and letters of being locked in basements and terrible things being done to them, and the parents turning to experts trying to figure out, what do I do um, when these false memories you know, are happening? So there is a foundation that is trying to study this in adults as well, and that is a resource. And as Deb has been saying, and all of us believe, is that the symbolic attitude is the thing that Jung affords us. Mm -hmm. and, and it is a medicine, it, it is, it's a vaccine, you know, so to speak, against getting sucked into this weird literalization that the unconscious communicates through symbols, which are bridges between conscious and unconscious content and this symbolic language shows up in dreams usually we know when we're dreaming but also fantasies religious imagery and even creative artistic work and it's not logical these images are not trivial but they're not to be taken at face value and this was part of jung's great tension with freud also, is he really wanted to look at dream symbols as having multiple layers of meaning, complexifying these things. So Jung really rejected concrete, literal attitudes, which then brings people into kind of a rigid, what they think of as factual way of interpreting things. And that leads to a kind of stubborn belligerence 
in, in any of us who are sure that we know all the facts and it is exactly, exactly that way. The other thing is that the symbols, or if we take everything in our life as having a symbolic equivalent, is showing us about tensions inside of ourselves. And for Jung, it's the tension of the opposites. Mm. So every time we're flooded with a frightening fantasies, let's say around death and destruction, somewhere in the unconscious, life is trying to show itself to you, which might happen in a dream. And both of these symbolic tensions of life and death, of creation and destruction, are both trying to show themselves to you because it grows consciousness. And when we collapse into only one side, we wind up just becoming inflated, which is why people get really loud and really big when they're caught in literalistic positions, because they have to defend against the symbolic level, which is trying to emerge in their dreams and in other ways. So approaching a approaching our lives from a psychological stance that that highlights the multiplicity of meanings that encourages all of us to look for unconscious meanings and unconscious dimensions. And if we're parents, to understand that our beautiful, wonderful children live in mythic worlds, and particularly as infants, when your child comes home and says, Daddy, bang, bang, you're dead, and Daddy, oh, grabs his chest and he falls on the ground, are you going to rush in the room and think that's literal? That, oh my God, my child wants to murder my husband. That's going to cause a lot of problems in your house, but most people instinctively know that it's a form of play, but that play comes from a mythic level. Mm -hmm. And your child is relying on you to hold the reality principle so that you can take their play in a calm, interested way. And let them play. And let them play. Right. If you go into a panic about something that your child is fantastically exploring, that is going to hurt your child, as well as put you into all kinds of paroxysms of horror. Mm -hmm. I think it might be time for us to switch to a dream. I think so. This is a 50-year-old woman who is um, a, a tribunal member and adjudicator, and the title of the dream is Meeting Young Himself. I am in Switzerland with M, my close friend and lawyer. First, I'm in a jewelry shop, which sells very beautiful and delicate Swiss gold jewelry. I like the jewelry, but I say to myself that once I get my money, I will buy myself a piece just like I bought a beautiful ring which was enameled with a painting of a row of houses by an Austrian artist many years ago. That happened last time I traveled to Austria or Switzerland. Emma and I go to Emma Young's home. Emma invites us to stay for the night. Em says that she is comfortable driving in the dark so we can leave after dinner. I don't offer any views. Then we begin making dinner. The dinner is served at Jung's house. Jung's house is the eighth largest house in the world. The dinner table is set with candles and decorations that resemble a lavish Thanksgiving table. Jung is sitting at the head of this very long table. The house of Jung is behind him and through the glass. It looks like an old terracotta colony or a beehive. It looks ancient and has multiple levels. The house is right behind Jung. The table is in a room that is surrounded by glass, and there are many people sitting around this long table. Once dinner is ready and the table is set, Em and I start serving the meat. The meat is beef and set in the center of the table in two columns. The columns of meat are unusually tall and have a square circumference. Em and I start carving the meat, but we shred a corner of it instead of cutting it. 
Jung tells us in a stern manner that meat is being ruined if it is shredded. It must be sliced instead. We serve the dinner, and after the dinner, we go for a walk around this glass dining room. Jung's library is outside this room, too. His library is the third largest library in the world, and I have donated a number of books to this library. After dinner, Emma tells us to stay and sleep there. We agree this time and sleep at Emma Jung's room for the night. For context, she notes the following. I had this dream the night I came back from a Zen mountain hiking retreat in Scotland. On the plane, I listened to one of the recent This Union Life podcasts on parental complexes. In recent months and and years, I have been working a lot on intergenerational complexes and trauma. The episode was very topical for me, and at the end, it had some reference to Jung's relationship with Emma's friend. I experienced betrayal when I was married years ago. I feel a bit stuck with the dynamics of my office and my workplace. I feel work has gone stale and don't appreciate the toxicity in the office. At the retreat, I had some insights about potentially changing my job or saying no to certain assignments. M is very unhappy in her job but is afraid of change. Recently, I collaborated in publishing a book on fairy tales. She said, for the feelings in the dream, when I woke up, I was super happy that I finally have met Jung and had my first dream about the man himself. This is my first dream after 10 years of analysis that Jung himself appeared. I've never had a dream about Jung, actually. Neither have I. I've been listening to your podcast. Here's some final associations. I've been listening to your podcast since they began. You have interpreted some of my pivotal and most important dreams, which referenced life-changing events. I feel this is also an important dream. I've been in analysis for 10 years and four years of Zen practice. I've been working on my relationship with money, work, vocation, and parental complexes recently. So we have at the outset of the dream, she is with her friend M. So we might, you know, wonder whether M is a shadow figure. What we know about M from the uh, associations is that M is very unhappy in her job, but is afraid of change. And so that seems to be, you know, sometimes I think if you have a shadow figure in a dream, a same-sex figure, It can be interesting to say, in what ways am I different from that person and how am I like that person? And here we have we have this similarity that there's an unhappiness with work and maybe a hesitance to make a change. What I go to next, I'm just going because this is a complicated dream of this particular piece of jewelry that has to wait to be purchased. Uh, when she gets her money. So some resource. We might think about psychic resource. Um, And then they go uh, to Emma Jung's home. So we start with Emma. And um, Em says she's comfortable driving in the dark so we can leave after dinner. So it has something to do with what's, what's the dark here in this shadow figure. Uh, and we know from the commentary that both are, you know, in a place where they're not especially happy in their lives or work. And then we begin making dinner in Jung's house, uh, which is the eighth largest house in the world. Um, it looks like an old terracotta colony or a beehive. And we're sort of like in Jung's house and also right outside of it at the same time. It's a little confusing. It looks ancient and Mm -hmm. has multiple levels. So I'm thinking about, wow, that is such a great image, a a house that is ancient and looks like a beehive, Uh, which is, of course, a really archetypal symbol. Bees and beehives exist all over the place. They've been. Symbols of bees have been images for kings, etc. And all the activity, the magic that happens in a beehive, where the bees go in and honey is made, and we never really get to see um, 
the inner life of this transformative process. Yeah, so it's some kind of like the house is sort of some kind of mound almost. It's and it's this very kind of ancient, almost kind of primitive structure, right? So referencing something very old. So what do what do we make of um it's interesting that there that there's Emma's house and then there's Carl's house and they're almost two different things. And there's this big long dinner table and these columns of meat. It's it's interesting because Jung is very stern in it. You know, a lot of times when I have heard people dream of Jung, he's a very kind of comforting figure. But here he's like, you're doing it wrong. You're ruining the meat because you're shredding it instead of slicing it. So that's an interesting distinction between slicing something and shredding it. And and one of the associations with slicing something is like um, the way the thinking function works. So if if the thinking function is nice and sharp, like a good knife, it can slice right through something. And of course, slicing is differentiating. You're sort of saying, this is this and this is that. So there's a kind of clarity to it. If you're shredding something, you're you're pulling it apart in a way that doesn't have that um, that clear distinction, I suppose. Yeah, it's the alchemical process of separatio. And maybe a kind of decisiveness, uh, the sharpness of the blade and the clean cut versus uh, something messier and uh, and maybe more ambivalent. So I'm going to kind of cut the meat, but I'm not so sure about this. And, of course, they're in columns, making the process more challenging. So it's, it seems like Jung, the inner Jung is inviting the dreamer to be more decisive, mm -hmm. right? Is that a possible way to think about it? There's something confusing about the dream that I'm just still yeah, um, moving is, through. I'm looking for there's some underlying pattern that I think is is moving through this that I'm not quite seeing yet. Mm -hmm. So it's making me just keep staring at it and going over it again and again. Yeah. The close friend who is a lawyer. So just using the keys that we do use, like, okay, that's probably a shadow figure. So what does it imply that a legalistic companion is, is going through this, this process with her? Um, one thing I'm just muddling around with, I'm curious when she says to herself that once I get my money, get my money, like that's a phrase I would explore with her. Um, where are you going to get money from? Are you, what, what is, is something pending that the dream ego is, knows about but we're not privy to because it's the conditional event? When that happens, then this will happen. So there's, there's a little pivot point that's being put into that moment that I'm just curious about. Well, and it's also delicate Swiss gold jewelry. So we think of gold as something really of supreme value. So I, I'm thinking about sort of Swiss gold. <laughs> and, uh, you know, I mean, I think when, when we're looking at, at dreams, and especially a dream with Jung in it, I haven't had a dream of Jung, but I have had dreams that took place in Switzerland. And many times when that happens, it's sort of like, oh, is this something about Jungian psychology? You know, so there's some gold there that she's not really ready to fully claim for herself yet, but she spied it out. She knows what she wants. She doesn't have the inner resources yet to take it. And there's some positive association having taken something from Austria or Switzerland before. There's, like you said, there's some gold in this dream, some gold in perhaps 
the story of Jung or the story of Emma, for that matter, um, who is who is being written more about um, coming forward in in the story of Jung's um, contributions. One of the things I thought was interesting was Emma features prominently. And she says later, just kind of in an offhand way, in the context, I was betrayed in my marriage. Mm -hmm. And I, you know, because that that's part of what comes up for me around Emma is she was this kind of long suffering wife who stood by her husband, supported him, even while he was engaged in, in an affair. So there was a there was a significant betrayal there. I'm thinking about the difference between uh, the dream ego's relationship with Emma and her friend M. Mm -hmm. uh, that Emma invites us to stay for the night, um, and at first I say no, 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 we'll we'll take off after dinner. Uh, in effect. And then, again, um, Emma invites them to stay and sleep there, mm -hmm. and they agree. And the contrast between this inclusiveness uh, and the image of, um, of the beehive and Jung at the head of a very long table with these columns of meat. <laughs> so we have some images of so of long and length and rectangularity uh, as contrasted with being invited in by, by Emma and, and being invited to sleep there. A and the separateness, um, I'm not altogether clear on how this works, but the separateness of the spaces. Yeah. Yeah. That's confusing. Uh, and this table's in a room surrounded by glass. So what's glass? Well, obviously it's transparent and you can see through it, but it is also a real barrier. And glass lets us, if I think about seeing and thinking, we can that's what it calls up for me. But we can't touch what is behind the glass. Uh, we can't smell it. We, we can't reach out to it. There's an invisible barrier. Uh, so I'm kind of wondering about that, and where might that be in the dreamer's life? I also, and I'm going um, right back to the end of the of the dream, the library where our dream ego has made some deposits, some donations, uh, some contributions, and then Emma tells them to stay. And they agree. Uh, I think uh, there's a, a really interesting and overall positive resolution. Yeah, it's, it's uh, a real dream. crisis, right? It's a real resolution. Emma, Emma invites us to stay. And I think you're right, Deb. There's something important about that library and the fact that the dreamer has made deposits in it. That the, the, the dreamer, um, there's this kind of repository of knowledge and some of it has been contributed to by the dreamer. So it, it makes me think back a little bit to the Swiss gold, you know, is the library also kind of, you know, a, a different kind of gold and, and that she's, she's contributed part. There's so she's been laying aside some, some resources into this library and now she can be kind of, uh, welcomed in by Emma. It's interesting to be, you know, Emma, precedes and and succeeds the the, the, Im the image of Carl you know so it's first they have contact with Emma and then they find CG and then it's Emma again so somehow it's almost like there's some kind of maybe feminine principle that's mediating the relationship with this anima anima excuse me this animus figure par excellence of of you know Jung, this this real this real image of Animus as kind of the wise old man, perhaps, you know, but who's who's chastising her a little bit. You need to do something different. But but meanwhile, there there continues to be this mediating factor. I think of Emma, although it's a little unclear. It's a little unclear from the 
that, you know, because she's very excited to have met Jung. And yet Jung was chastising her. So I find that a little confusing, too. Or um, he is directing her in that sort of patriarchal uh, way uh, that a patriarch can say, no, you know, don't sit there, sit here. Or don't do it like that, do it like this. That He's just directive. Mm-hmm. Uh, you're going to ruin it if you are not decisive and sharp and don't just slice through something. Yeah. Instead of, you know, sort of, of shredding it, which for me just calls up this image of a little timidity about, oh, my God, do I dare to really just, you know, bring the knife down? Mm-hmm. Um, yes. And yes. that process of recommending, it's an alchemical process, the process of separatio uh, and swords and all kinds of things come into that of just sometimes you cut through something, uh, you know, like the famous uh, apocryphal story of Alexander the Great, who comes to a city of uh, Gord or whatever the name of it was. And they, there's, it's roped off by this very intricate knot. And, and he's told, well, until you can take this knot apart, uh, you cannot enter the city. And it's unbelievably intricate and impossible. So Alexander the Great takes out his sword and cuts the knot, cut the Gordian knot. That's, that's, a, that's a good association, I think. Uh, so I don't interpret, I mean, the dream ego says, um, Jung tells them in a stern manner, mm -hmm. but we might say, okay, that's a, perce that's a perception, a felt stern, there, no question, but maybe it was just directive. You know, I wonder if I had to kind of um, uh, gently offer a possible interpretation of this dream. It might be saying something about her timidity uh, and her lack of decisiveness, perhaps around her job and whether or not it's time to perhaps consider a different kind of work or a different job. And, and I, you know, again, I think there's the promise of the gold jewelry and there's the promise maybe of the, of the wisdom that's in, available in this library. Um, but, but she, uh, she, she both is being invited, I think, to be a little bit more decisive, but there's also this um, the, this kind of feminine relatedness around it that that's that's offering kind of acceptance, you know, in in this in this uh, figure of of Emma. Maybe maybe you know, it's it's like, well, stay here after dinner, stay here, don't drive tonight, stay here and digest. You know, maybe it's okay to take a little time or something and sleep like that. on it. And sleep mm -hmm. on it. Yeah. So partly for me, this dream calls up uh, how, how difficult and lacking and nice, um, pardon the phrase, clear cut, <laughs> decisive meaning there can be in a dream. And that this is part of the process as we approach a dream. We, we look into it as best we can and bring into it what we can and set it aside and then go back to it. Uh, see what else you dream. What did you dream before this? What else is going on? So that there's an ongoing process in working with any, any single dream. Uh, sometimes there's a real, ah, that's it. I got it. That's, that's the core of it for me that um, aha moment. And sometimes dreams call us back. Come back to me. Look at me again. For me, and again, I feel like there's maybe something's missing from the dream. Uh, maybe there's more content that just didn't get recalled. It seems like, based on what she has said, and this has been inferred before, is that she's highly identified with Emma, and that when she is in the proximity of her idea of Emma, then she behaves like Emma. She offers no views. She makes dinner. She serves and carves meat. She goes for a walk, and she goes to sleep. 
but that there is something about that and the fact that the dream ends with her losing consciousness. Mm. So mm, I think that's interesting. Sometimes um and, and we see this all the time, that if we've been reading Jung for a long time, we have a lot of fantasy material about him, his life, his family, and we can become overly identified with the historic narrative, which is really quite secondary to the concepts and the utility of analytical psychology. So there's Jung and his family, and then there's the books that she has donated to his library. And so the books, I think, represents one way that she had been relating to analytical psychology is through ideas and perhaps the utility of ideas. But now, she seems to be very heavily identifying with Emma Jung. And I'm not clear what the utility in that is, but I could say that the utility of the dream is that you're heavily identified with Emma Jung. I wonder why. I wonder perhaps how that is interesting to you. In one way, it could be a um, somewhat fantasy way of feeling closer to Jung, because she she then is by extension kind of the spouse of Jung, um, I'll bet beleaguered and and long suffering. So that may be some way of coming into relationship, but I, but I challenge her heavy identification with Emma if for no other reason than it leads to sleep. And it would just be a conversation that I would have very speculatively. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's interesting, Joseph. Thanks for listening. To submit a dream, suggest an episode topic, or join our mailing list, visit our website, thisunionlife.com. If you enjoyed this episode, give us five stars and a good review on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, or wherever you get your podcasts. Subscribe to our YouTube channel and make sure to click the notification bell to be alerted whenever we upload videos. And keep up with all things TJL by following us on Instagram, Facebook, X, and TikTok.